You all ready? Thank you for coming to this press conference. Um, let me apologize for holding the press conference in the yard of our office here on Church Street because we've had an extended blackout and it's very hot in there. And um, not, not that we haven't grown accustomed to the heat because so many Guyanese now face this on a daily basis. Um, the large number of blackouts, um, sometimes for extended periods, and them having to address this without any relief whatsoever from the government in the short term, and no plan for addressing this in the medium to long term. So, we, it can only get worse. And you know what? What bothers me the most is that this government, because it did not adjust the electricity prices downwards, has been raking in large sums of money compared to the past. And so many times I've argued that they have raked in in excess of $20 billion. And I saw the chairman of the board, Mr. Badal, who is an AFC financier and supporter, disputed me about the figures, but they've never said how much money they've collected since the coalition got in office once fuel prices fell. And um, without them adjusting appropriately the electricity rates. So they're just raking in large sums of money while the situation is deteriorating, that is the supply of electricity. So we, we heard about the kill the hydro, that's a done deal. Um, we heard about wind power, how they were in the first, since the first budget that they were negotiating a power purchase agreement. We didn't hear much more about that after we exposed that it would have been a corrupt act with another AFC financier. Then we heard about a 50 megawatt gas uh, um, fired power plant. It seems as though we're not hearing much more about that any longer. The latest iteration of this, this sort of confusion and excuse is the president saying we'd become a solar state. Now, whatever that means, because solar cannot be base load electricity. And, and then we've heard, we've seen some big ads from the unit managing the work still sets about how much money we have saved, etc. That's all we are getting from the minister and his minions. So what's going to happen in the country? We're going to see a rapid deterioration in the supply of electricity, more blackouts, and it would harm not just individuals, but business. So I just wanted to make that point to emphasize how terrible it is that in 2018, we're faced with this sort of situation and no plan by the government to address it. Um, on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, I took the opportunity with a team of people, including some members of parliament, to visit several communities in Region 3, starting from Windsor Forest to Ubu Bagdam and then across the river to Leguan. And having interacted with these communities, many people there are very concerned about the direction that they see the country going in. And they, they read the newspapers, um, they see the television news, they look at the internet, there are stories on the internet. And for them, it seems as though, and these came out from the comments at the meeting, that there is 
a reduction in security, that safety increase in crime, that people are rapidly losing jobs and that there are no prospects for more jobs in the future because investments are drying up. They are worried about the daily reports of large-scale corruption taking place in the government. They are confused and sometimes they don't, can't even believe that so much incompetence would be demonstrated on a daily basis, particularly by top officials of this government. And so those were the general concerns people expressed about their future, about jobs, about welfare, and um, about their safety. But there were also specific concerns raised, and I hope that if this government pays attention because it is, it is trapped in the, the policies that they build, uh, and I don't mean literal policies, but the policies of privileges that they have built since they got into office, high, high salaries, Tons of people around them, fleets of vehicles, security, personal assistance, perks, um, conferences and dinners at Marriott's, etc., at the Marriott Hotel. And they're trapped in that. And they're forgotten that there are a large group of people out there who need to, to have their concerns heard. And so if they were to just travel to these communities, they would. Uh, see not just the concerns, they would hear not only of the concerns that people have generally about the direction of the country, but the specific ones. For example, the Stortville and Anna Katrina and Zealot meetings and the one at Windsor Forest. People were concerned about the state of the sea defenses. That was a huge concern that they raised there. And um, because they told me that it's scrap. All of the community roads, many which we did years ago, have been deteriorating. Huge potholes. The farm to market roads are now non existent in some of these communities, and they are primarily agricultural communities. They, they express serious concerns in many areas about the closure of Wales, as the Wales estate, and how it's affecting them personally the ability of children to to go to school and their ability to provide food in their to their families the price of paddy and the was another issue but more importantly the lack of support by this government to the industry although this industry is one that has in addition to the gold mining sector that has practically kept this economy afloat in the past few years because of production levels. They've responded, the farmers have gone to the fields in spite of the fact that there is an assault by the coalition government on this sector from increasing land and DNI charges sometimes by over 500% to a tax on all of the inputs into the sector the tax on machinery and equipment that they now have to pay if tractors com combined, etc. Nevertheless, they have responded. And, um, but it is very difficult. And this government could actually help if it was sympathetic, a productive sector. And it will be good for the economy. Um, there were, they, across all of these areas and hospitals in the region, but this is a concern raised um, at every meeting I've gone to, not just in Region 3, but across the country, deep in the mountains, um, Tiger Pond all the way up in Region 9, or deep south, is the same story. Until now, there is a lot shortage of drugs. From basic things, people said to me that they can't, they can't afford it now that they, because the income is cut in many cases, then they have a tax on pharmaceuticals that this coalition government put, put in place, 
Um, so they have to pay 14% tax on the stuff that they bought. And when they turn to the public health system, there's nothing here. Uh, one of uh, a person said to me, someone had to go to Diamond and got stitches without any an anesthesia. Got stitches at Diamond because there was none here. But like basic drugs for people who are diabetic, you know, who have high blood pressure and stuff like that, they can't get it, get those things. And if you talk to doctors, quietly they will tell you that the system seems to be falling apart. Um, they, they spoke about drainage and irrigation. It seems as though this government has stopped doing drainage and irrigation in some areas. And that's the lifeblood of the agricultural sector. So whilst we hear big talk about you know, how much money they're spending on all of these issues, they, they, they seem to not, not to understand that agriculture can do well unless you focus on drainage and irrigation waiting to happen um, because it, it can collapse at any time. The people mention issues about the tokens, etc. Um, I've also heard about a lot of the people who are coming back from Venezuela um, because they come to the region tree and that sometimes their children who are born in Venezuela but of Guyanese parentage they're stopped at the border by agents of the state and they sent back so we need to investigate this to see that this doesn't happen if you're born of Guyanese parentage you should be allowed free access into this country we allow anyone to come here they can come through uh, uh, I know come into our country and we should be more charitable to our own people because these they just were born in Venezuela but their parents are Guyanese and some people who come with spouses who are Venezuelan so that they have difficulties too. I heard a lot of stories about that in region 3 so I just thought I, I mentioned these few things with the hope that the coalition government would just stop sleeping and enjoying all the perks and start looking at some of the real issues that people face on the ground. Uh, if, if only what they were to go out, then they would look at this. There are quite a few other issues that where, apart from the neglect and not doing anything to help people in these areas or many other areas, it seems as though every day there was someone in this government who wakes up in the morning and thinks about which set of poor people they can now implement policies to harass. So it's the rice farmers one day, it's the vendors another day, and now it's the bus busmen. Now, whatever their... Yesterday I was going to Parliament and there was a protest at the Square of the Revolution. And people asked me to stop. And listening to them, they said to me, um, they were told that their buses don't meet certain specifications, although GRE approved, gave them the licenses. That their fitness was revoked by the police, and they were told until they can make adjustments which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, not just the adjustments, but the investment that they made, made or huge money to, to put some, not vulgar images on their buses, but some, um, some images on their buses, like stars, etc. That they can't work. Now, I promise to look into the law. I, I did not take a position at the meeting because I said, let me look at what the law says. But even if the law is on the side of the authority or the, the authorities, then people have to be given time to make a transition. You can't stop them from working and earning a living. Many of them have loans. That's their livelihood. You can't come wake up one morning and say, tomorrow you have to stop and make the adjustment which costs them millions of dollars. Especially 
if you were licensing it before and for years this it but they were operating it in this way you have to give them transition period i recall when we wanted the taxis to go in yellow we i met with the people directly as president and i said you'll have time and we said all the paint and everything else you'll get duty free to assist people to make that transition you have to t this is a humanitarian thing it's an approach that this coalition has heavy handed we want to change the mashramani route so we need to clean out all the vendors from the starbuck market square and now they've changed it back you know we're gonna go in there take away the land from all of these farmers and give it to a couple of our our big boys you know regardless of who we are afro Ghanese, indo Ghanese doesn't matter supporters no supporters they're poor they suffer and so this is another instance of it and then also the callous behavior of this government is silent so long in relation to those many security guards who have been battling for their wage, wages and salaries that they are owed by a company and there seems to be no sympathy on the part of the government for those workers in region 5 no sympathy whatsoever the first time they went to the boardroom of the, the RDC they were kicked out by the REO unceremoniously as though they don't have a place you know in to hear their voices in the, in this country and in the government structures and even then when they protested the REO threatened many of them threatened them and said they couldn't have their office anymore in the compound of the RDC so this this is the approach of the government and then they were trying for ages to meet even we tried to get the the minister responsible keith scott to meet with him and they refused to it's only when we started they, they started protesting and some of our mps got involved and we and the region that is the rdc the the chairman of the region and our councillors, the pvp people now we hear they said they will take action against the company could have done that right at the beginning and sought to give some relief to people but it, but they did not in fact they took the side of the company so again you see that happening and now um we see the government again the pnc this time um at the city council in spite of all that we have heard about how atrocious king is and the current mayor and almost the entire civil society and all decent mining citizens thinking that they are not good for the city the pnc part of the coalition persisted in reinstating them the AFC part of the coalition and the PVP uh, councillors there, they fought against this. But the AFC councillors there were fighting a losing battle. Why? Because the AFC national leaders have already sold out all of the ordinary AFC members. They don't care too much. In fact, they got booted out, the AFC there, from the vice mayor position, the deputy mayor position. So, that, that, why did this happen? And you didn't hear a single word of protest from any senior AFC leader, not Ramjatan, not Nagamutu, wherever he is now. But I see he's writing his column, he's Schwarzenegger, I, I shall be back, or I will be back. He's Schwarzenegger now. Yeah. And, no, 
um, not from Trotman, the leader of the party, or anyone else, the Dominic Gaskin and all the other likes, the Cathy Hughes and all of the others. Because why? Why? They are enjoying themselves and the perks. They are, they're, they're happy. Their bread is well buttered. They move their salaries up. They're going to retire in the future with big pensions. Pensions calculated on this new salary structure that we, where the taxpayers, will have to fund for years to come. Remember my pension? You're calling about it? Well, we have a ton of them they'll carry in the future that we'd have to carry. They're well bred, well buttered. So they're, they're kicked out. They are the Cummingsburg Accord. I don't know if it's still there or not. Whether they raised it with, they said they raised it with Granger one time. Granger said, nobody raised that with me. They were lying again. I think they're afraid by, to ra by raising it, they may lose their positions. So that's dead. They are now fully with the PNC, all of them. And so God helps any ordinary AFC person who needs support from this bunch in government, now with the executive because they're going to throw them under the bus without a protest, without or excusing government. And the same thing you see what has happened at the Chronicle. It's a, a manifestation of the same thing at the Chronicle with the removal of Heinz and the others. Um, they, I'm still very concerned about the, the border issue. Um, after grain, we pushed Granger. We said this is a national issue. You should address the nation or the parliament. We should have a joint resolution in parliament. We just had a sitting of the parliament. Nothing of that sort came up. We have another sitting, and it's for the 26th of April, all the way to the 26th of April. Nothing in sight for that. Granger promised that the army, not the executive, will brief the security committee of the, par the parliament, that has not happened. They're treating the border issue callously and in a very partisan manner. Um, so we have also seen the confusion surrounding and the division surrounding the appointment of the Kaisuko board. Imagine this government, it just can't get its anything done well you know like so they they screwed up the industry then you had mixed signals the people should be terminated not terminated now just appointing a board um they they have so much confusion surrounding it just a board it's as though they can't get the simplest things right much less much less the more complex issues of managing this state, providing jobs for people, um, better welfare for them, charting a, a future for Guyana. If you can't get those little things right. So we, these are just some of the issues um, I wanted to raise. They were very thin skin too. Yesterday I I issued a statement about how critical they were of the U.S. ambassador. I think, I think what they were worried about is that if the ambassador said a sovereign wealth fund bill, and I'm just quoting a section in the broadest sense, that is transparent, independent, inviolable, and nonpartisan. They have problems with all of these things. The transparency, the independence, the, the inviolable nature of the fund because they have violated it already from the 18 million, and the nonpartisan issue. And so they took big objection to that, and the ambassador rightly pointed out that without this fund, basically, well, without the sovereign wealth fund, and the clarity around the sovereign wealth fund we can have billions of dollars of flows it doesn't mean anything unless you tell people what it's going to be used for how it's going to be used in a nonpartisan 
manna, etc. But they have big issues with that very thin skin. And then they love to make excuses. It's everyone else's uh, fault. Everyone else's fault. So if tomorrow you hear, you know, of a crash on the road, then it had to be the PVP fault. We put a speed bump there or something else. So all the time making excuses. So we would have thought that it was protectionist measure on the part of the Americans. They were peddling that since the FDA manages other species of fish um, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture regulates catfish, catfish in the broad sense of the word, um, that the USDA was more prone to protectionism and that is why they they banned the export of catfish from Guyana, which will affect tons of people. When I heard of it, I called someone who was exporting, and he said to me that 80% in value terms is, is the catfish, because although they do export a lot of the, the other types of fish, that their price, like Bangomeri and the others, are lower, like the, a dollar per pound or 150 or something like that. But like Segelbaka, it's very expensive. So in value terms, it would mean a lot. This will devastate a lot of fishermen in Burbies and, and here and in Demerara and, and Region 3, particularly some from, from Tutu. Devastate them. And guess what happened? It was only then we discovered after U.S. issued a statement that it's the incompetence of this government that caused it. They were told about it 18 months ago, November 2015, and they never did anything about change, uh, you know, addressing the concerns. And now they blame the U.S. for doing it. And we would have believed that had the U.S. not issued a statement. So making excuses. So what we have every day makes me even more depressed that they just confuse, confuse government, corrupt, not um, blaming other people, not focused on uh, people's concerns, particularly ordinary people living in the, spending up all of our money. And they're busy going through our money. I saw the gold reserves went down to not just the financial reserves, the coal reserves practically collapsed. They sold out, sold out all of those. So, so they're busy going through the, the stocks that we have left on useless things. Thank you very much. And again, let me apologize for us having to be outside today. No, we don't have. I did not want to say anything about that stupid comment that he made and uh, urging people. That's why I avoided it. Because you can prosecute people if they have the means to, to send their children to school. And um, they don't. In Barbies, our counselors at the RDC passed a motion that the government should help to send the kids to school, to pay for them to go to school for the sugar workers who are laid off because they can't afford it. The REO has refused to write the ministry about this matter. The government has not responded. This government took away the $10,000 grant from school kids. They could easily re restore it for the sugar workers and their kids. Because it's not a hundred, we have 167,000 children that they took it away from. This, In this case, it would be a few thousand that they'd have to restore it to, but they don't. Granger has been 
getting all these buses and putting his name on the buses everywhere else. He could have put his name on a couple of buses to those communities too. But give, allow them in a real way because you just took away their father's and mother's job to give these children a real chance of going to school. But no, no response. And then they call on the, the police to prosecute their parents for not sending them to school. If you don't have money to pay, how do you do that? To, to pay the bus or you know, whatever else they use to get to school. How do you do that? It's just this uncaring uh, approach to people and their welfare. It, that, is, that is how I'll respond to it. But they, they, they wouldn't do anything of that, that sort. Yeah. On, on Sunday last, um, in Barbizio, kind of laid out a plan leading up So what I did, I laid out an outline. There are hundreds of details that we have to fill in. Now a speech of that nature for a short period would not allow me to lay out the comprehensive plan that we've developed that will take us back to power. But I've made it clear, I did so as General Secretary of the party. Now, I'm the head of the party. So that's what I spoke of. Uh, and my job as General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party is to prepare the party to take power. And that means strengthening the party, working on a strategy to broaden the base of the party. And I've said that before, um, you know, in our strongholds to have people return who left and also in APNU strongholds to have people come in and join your party. Thirdly, to lay clear what our policies would likely be in the future and how we will accommodate the, major, the concerns of major interest groups in society, including civil society, because they do have major concerns. So the platforms that we will run on what commitments we will give, that's why I, I spoke about a compact with civil society. What commitments we will give to civil society. And then... <laughs> what comments we will give to, to... What commitments we will give and how we will um, make sure that we have a mechanism to implement those commitments. So, so this, is, um, this is important. So that is as General Secretary of the party. No, no. And if not, when? Because the last time around, the Prime Ministerial candidate came So, so um, one, we have not made that decision. That decision will be made at the appropriate time. But uh, what I wanted to say to you is that as General Secretary, regardless of who the presidential candidate is, I have a job. And my job is, as what I laid out to you, about broadening the, ba the base of the party, 
strengthening it on the ground, crafting a strategy for the future, making commitments, policy commitments to different groups of people, ensuring that when we get into office, we don't break those commitments so that they have a say in helping to implement the commitments, etc. That's my job as General Secretary. That's what I'm doing now. And, uh, and that's why I took the job as General Secretary. Had I not I want to do this, then I wouldn't have um, become General Secretary. If you have, if you have a, a time no, right now, that, that has not been decided. And um, that, as I said before, that's a moot issue at this time. I have a job, I'm doing my job as General Secretary of the party. Are you not thinking about presidential? I have a job now to, to why are you asking me this? I answer this a hundred times about where, when we when we decide on who our candidate will be, it will be someone who the party cho cho chooses and it will be consistent with the laws of the country. Well, two things, right? Uh, Charles Ryan, um, any comments on the partially unemployment figures that were released? Um, the, by the IDB. I, I don't pay too much attention to these things because anecdotally, I know some consultants sometimes fly in and do these, these surveys, etc. And so anecdotally, I looked at it on the way to Parliament and I saw they said there's been a growth in employment in the agricultural sector. Now, <laughs> you know from the time you hear that, you have to say something is wrong because in the forestry sector, which agriculture comes under, production has almost fallen by 60% at one time. It recovered slightly now, so by half. And lots of people I know traveling to, talking to people in Linden, when I went here, they can't sell their logs, etc. Huge amount of people unemployed here. Six, seven thousand people in the sugar belt, and with the others now, the allied sectors, you know, that's just sugar workers, but in the markets and everywhere else, people have lost their jobs. So, that alone should tell you rice production went down a bit. So, I don't pay too much attention to this. Anecdotally, you talk to people on the ground, losing jobs, not there, are no possibility of jobs in the future. So I've seen a lot of surveys done, etc. I don't, I don't, I don't put too much store on those numbers. On the border concerns, uh, you mentioned that you received no word from the government on when the committee will be doing the NDC. Um, no, but that's great. We've received nothing from Granger. He's gone silent. He just said that in passing. After pressure, being pressured as to why he's not treating this as a national issue, addressing the people of Guyana or the parliament, getting a resolution passed through parliament saying we support the decision of the UN Secretary General. You know, that would be good if you have an, a resolution where all the sides get up and say we support this. And then um, talking about preparing people for the threat that we have but he he is very petulant too and he um, because I, he said it he didn't do it I think he has a problem with doing it you know and they live in this this thing it's our time now that's your philosophy it's our time now impervious to any any suggestion anything else, comments, criticisms, etc. They built this solid concrete wall, steel wall around their, themselves, and they live in that environment, thinking that everything is going well in Guyana, and that they are wonderful people. Your party had um, requested from the Public Procurement Commission that they um, investigate certain things. Um, have you received any feedback from them? I, uh, some of our, I think Gail Tishir and the others wrote directly. I have to find out a bit about what the response was. So I will ask them to, to make that public. On um, the issue with the nomination of the Transparency of Justice... Um, I have not heard anything further from Granger. Mr. Jack, 
that you had said that, um, I think it was last year, that you would be on your self distance from the, um, the church and ruling issue with the case. I want to know, what is your position on this issue? Not, not that you're in the case, but what is your position? Are you supporting you know, the ruling or what's your the, uh, what it, It's not, it was clear I signed that into law. So I signed it into law and it's challenge. Signing it into law means I had to agree with it. So that was, that's my position. That's my position. I have a second question, Mr. Jack. Do, I want to know if your party has any mechanism in place where you monitor your MPs, like your behavior or performance or things like that. I'll, I'll tell you why I ask you. But I want to know if, if, you, if your party has that. Um, what do you mean by like monitor their behavior? Like put a tracking device no, around no, no, them no. or something? Like monitor the, their, let's say. Like oh, we don't get public, into people's public, personal life. Let me tell you something. Personal, Once, but their public okay. Behavior. Personal people's personal lives. I believe in privacy. Right. I'm a strong advocate of privacy. What takes place in people's homes and in their private affairs should not. Um, Government has no business in that sort of thing. That's personal life and whatever people do, etc. However, if what they do in the private domain affects you politically, then that's a different matter because it crosses uh, that that divide. Um, but outside, that they must be treated equally. That there must be some decorum in public life, in public life. These are some basic principles that we expect every MP, to our, every member of the party to pursue. That's what we do, broadly defined. But we don't have like, you know, I don't have a, a group that every day takes off, say, did one day, will go to church today, uh, take him off, you know, and something. We don't have that sort of one. No, I'll tell you why I ask, I'll tell you my question. I ask because a Saturday when there was a press briefing here, MP Gil Tishiri spoke of bringing people's personal health into politics and things like that. But then we saw, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, your MP Nigel Garner was ranting about someone from so who had a cold and cancer and his own face. But carrying on with that, but then he was sponsored by a journalist who I heard from the quality of Julia Johnson. And as a member of a friend's position, I think I could raise this concern with you. Yeah. No. Now, what you should do? That that's where the press association should write, right? And then I look at it. I look at it because I don't go. Frankly speaking, I have a Facebook page, but I visited it maybe three times since it was established. You wouldn't believe that. And and I should because it's managed. And I don't pay too much attention to that because there are lots of things and said online, and we keep saying, you have a group of people dedicated to stirring up racism, many with fake pros and profiles. I urge people not to pay attention to them. Not because they express pro pvp sentiments that they are PVP people necessarily. They want to create that impression. And I've seen it happen in the last elections and the one in 2011, where it was almost like a group of people dedicated to push racism online. You saw like how had the three persons who were killed yesterday, two or three persons, happened under our era, in the past that same group would have said it's PPP um, doing extrajudicial ki killing of innocent black people. That's how it would have been portrayed in the past and you know that. That is what would have happened had, had it happened in our era. So that's why I don't really go every day online to check all of these these things etc although i do believe it's a very important medium for sharing views for sharing views and uh, since uh, i'm a strong advocate of technology using technology to improve lives and communication we should use it but we have to be measured and so i uh, this is important this is very important what people say here so if 
if there is anything, I personally don't go, but if there is anything that, say, the Press Association finds or anyone finds offensive there that might have conveyed the impression that it's a PPP's position, you please, please let us know and we will we'll address it. We'll address it. Well, you look if you look at the sugar belt and the rice belt, that's what I was talking to because about 15% of the rice farmers in CS to Coco Coast vote in the AFC and, or well, the coalition. And um, a lot of, the same thing happened about 10% of the sugar workers. Obviously, when you talk to them now, many of them were misled. They were told that they would get, that we were ripping them off through the petro deal. That is what Nagamutu and Ramjetan and many others went on the ground. Some Gina Raham and, and a whole gang of them went out there and said to people, you're being ripped off. There's all this money in the central bank and you can get it $6,000, $9,000 a bag for party. Of course, obviously they didn't get it. So they're very disappointed. The reason they left is because of that promise. So they're back automatically. We didn't have to do much work. And the sugar workers are the same. And there are many others who, like pensioners, who believe they would get a 100% increase in the first 100 days. So the coalition government itself is, because it has not kept it, its promise to people, people who were, many of who were with the PVP has contributed to people coming back to the party because now there is a comparison of policies once again. And so that's what we're doing, that, that, that alone. And our polls show maybe 30 to 35 percent, that's what they will get to combine. That is PNC and PNC, AFC all, all combined. I want to know, Mr. John, if you're keeping, um, if you've been keeping notice of what is happening at Sikiyali, if you have, what is your thoughts on what is your thoughts <clears throat> One, clear, PNC cabal defending itself with the support of central government players to continue the wanton acts of corruption on, on, in the city. Nothing else. And obviously, they benefited. And this is our information was from some of the people, they may not come out in the public, that the contract for the parking meter was not 2080. It was 20, 2010. 20 for the city, 20 for the party, Congress place, and 10 for individuals. That is what they said. So they couldn't come out and say, but, but that was what the real numbers were. And so that's why they're, they fought tooth and nail to get the contract implemented. That's why Bulkan approved the bylaws. Because without the government approving cabinet and Bulkan approving the bylaws, that parking meter project would have been dead. They did it. The cabinet with Bulkan, a member of the PNC. And even now they're trying to resurrect it because there's money in it for them. And so I suspect these white elephants like this one here, look just out here. The white elephants that we have here that they spent hundreds of millions. We're only talking about recently and the cemetery. Find out about just after the coalition government took office, we saw some cleaning up in the city. And we thought, oh, it's donation from private individuals. Some of them gave donations. But it was the city council money too that they used to, without any tender, to give a few people contracts. We should, we should really do an audit and trace where the money went. 
hundreds of millions of dollars is spent. And like Durban Park, it went into private pockets. So Durban Park said no, zero cost to the Treasury, first, first supplementary, 450 million, second supplementary, over 500 million, nearly a billion dollars of public funds, 1.4 billion spent here. And they said they received 27 million to, um, in private donations in cash and kind of lie. And um, up to now, they don't have documents. So city council is just the conduit. And this cabal in city council that they keep putting back there, foisting on the people of Georgetown, is to ensure that they, these arrangements flow. And I'm convinced that the reason that they, they're also not terminating that contract, the bond, is because money is flowing elsewhere too. Thank you.